All right, David Livingston, notoriously not a good-looking guy, although I think he looks pretty good, but that was one of the kind of rumors that circulated about him, as we'll see. He was a rather short man, about 5'5", five, five. Uh, so not exactly what you'd call the at least uh, paradigm of a great adventurer, not an Indiana to Jones type or something. Born in Scotland, Blonter, Scotland, by the age of 10, he was employed full-time, which means 12 hours a day, age 10, working in a, uh, a cotton mill. Textile industry, of course, in England at that time, uh, point was a major industry, and many children were employed in this way. And then his, in his off hours, David Livingston simply read. He was a voracious and brilliant student, but once again, born into a family that didn't have all that much in terms of financial means. His father, Neil Livingston, was a door-to-door -door tea salesman, kind of like the version of the brusher, no, no, what is it, the fuller brush salesman, you know. Uh, that's what happens when I go off script. <laughs> but uh, anyway, uh, Neil would go around selling tea door-to-door. -door. Tea was a major industry as well, as you know, in England. He was a Sunday school teacher in a congregational church. Again, I'd like to claim Livingston as a Presbyterian. Unfortunately, I can't. He was a Congregationalist. That was the non-official or, uh, in a sense, non-conformist church in Scotland. Of course, the official church there was Presbyterian, but uh, he grew up in that background. Interestingly, Neil Livingston, the father, was very fearful of science. Science at this time in history was increasingly being viewed as a threat to the Christian faith. It was like an alligator that kept attacking, you know. You think about the major philosophers of the 19th century, and for the most part, they were riding on the wake of scientific advances, and for the most part, were atheistic in their outlook. Auguste Comte and his positivism, or Ludwig Feuerbach and his radical humanism, or Charles Darwin and his evolutionary views of things, or Freud, you see, and his kind of psychological science, all atheistic, at least in their philosophical perspective, and all of them, in a sense, arguing that faith has a relatively unimportant place in life. Science is going to save us. Neil, therefore, viewed science as the enemy. And that was something of the atmosphere in which David Livingston grew up, but he never liked it very much. He was scientifically oriented himself, and indeed, a fair amount of what he's remembered for in his labors in Africa was scientific in character because of that particular penchant. He was transformed personally by reading a fellow who was kind of an apologist philosopher for the Christian faith at the time named Thomas Dick. Thomas Dick wrote a couple of books that really were influential for Livingston. One of them was called Philosophy of Religion, and the other was called Philosophy of Future State. I doubt that any of us in this room are familiar with either of those, but for David Livingston at the moment, it was life-changing because it gave him a way to think about science as still being in service to God and his kingdom and his cause and his glory. The traditional view was that God has given us his truth in two books, the book of the Bible, special revelation, the book of nature, general revelation, and that the two are perfectly compatible. And that was essentially what Thomas Dick was arguing, and that's what David Livingston embraced. And I think throughout his career, that was how he thought about that. And so his scientific interest was really in service as he saw it to his Christian faith. He himself says he really embraced the Christian faith personally at about the age of 20, and it was largely from reading these works by Thomas Dick. He was immediately taken with the prospect of becoming a missionary. He was aware of William Carey and his experience in India, and somehow or other, David Livingston believed he had a similar call on his life. At the beginning, he thought his call would be to China. And so early on, that was where he really focused his interest. As you know, it was Hudson Taylor, eventually, who winds up going to China. But originally, that was really what David Livingston thought would take place. In about 1834, as he's reaching adulthood now, he's thinking about how to prepare himself for missionary endeavor, and he, with his scientific interest, felt that at least it would be natural for him to be trained medically. And so along with seeking 
theological education. He also, in effect, went to medical school, and for the next four years or so, he sort of worked on both fronts until about 1840. He was competent. He was really what we would call a medical doctor by the standards of that day, and he was also trained competently in theology. At that point, he applied for missionary status with the London Missionary Society. I mentioned uh, the London Missionary Society last week. It was one of those mission societies created in the wake of the labors of William Carey. There were many of them by this time. This was one of the more prestigious. And so David Livingston applied and was initially rejected because he couldn't preach. He was a lousy public speaker. Isn't that encouraging? I just <laughs> love that. This guy couldn't stand up in front and talk, you know. He was, it was flat affect. It was dry and crusty. It was a little bit too cerebral. And they thought to themselves, this guy will never make a missionary. You know. But somehow, by pleading and so on and his other skills, he squeaked in the back door and was able to achieve missionary status with the London Missionary Society. By this time, he had shifted his interest from China to Africa, largely because of the reports of a guy working there in Africa whose name was Robert Moffat. Moffat was already there, but was confining his interest to South Africa. South Africa, if you know anything of the history of that part of the world, you know that earlier on, there had been a population of Dutch reformed folks that had shown up there, and they came to be called the Boers. B-O-E-R, and so they had established essentially a fairly racist kind of enclave of white settlers in South Africa and had really worked out a fairly systematic uh, approach that was discriminatory to any black participation in their little society. Uh, and I say they were Dutch Reformed originally, they had really devolved, I think, from the vision of their Dutch Reformed uh, heritage by that point. If you're familiar with that, you've heard of the Boer Wars, for example. In the early 20th century, it still involved these people. The whole apartheid philosophy of South Africa that was very, of course, conspicuously part of 20th century history, Nelson Mandela, all of that, all of it goes back to these people. Robert Moffat was there as a Christian missionary, and he was there to preach the gospel to the native population in Africa, and that was earning him no points with the Boers. And so they were resisting him powerfully. And that was appealing to David Livingston. He wanted to go and participate in that particular aspect of the campaign, really, to bring the gospel to Africa. So in 1840, he sails off, he arrived there, and he shows up in a place called Kuriman, which is, uh, you can see it on the map there, it's uh, about 60 miles in, and it, was, it had not yet been been uh, visited by a, a, a European missionary. So he arrives there for his first experience <clears throat> in a mission setting, and he was there six months isolated with the Bakwanian tribe. And he was able to establish a rapport with them early on. The terms that have been used to describe him and the impression he created among the native population there were, were terms like this, he was fearless, he was genial, he was kind, he was competent. Aren't those great words, you know? Uh, and that was the kind of person he was. He was a quiet man. He wasn't loud, boisterous. He was very intelligent, very methodical, very warm-hearted, however, and very approachable. All of that is a universal testimony of David Livingston. Early on in his experience among the Bakwains, he had a convert, rather unusual, a chief, of a Bakwain tribe by the name of Shekele, who came to faith, and Livingston actually writes in his journal a record of some of his early interactions with this man as he was coming to faith. And it's so interesting, I'm gonna take the time to read a little bit of this to you. This is Livingston writing, describing conversations with Shekele. Shekele then inquired if my forefathers knew of a future judgment. I replied in the affirmative and began to describe the scene of the great white throne and him who shall sit upon it, from whose face the heaven and earth shall flee away. Of course, quoting from Revelation 20. You startle me, Shekele replied. These words make my bones shake. I have no strength in me. 
but my forefathers were living at the same time yours were. And how is it that they did not send them word about these terrible things sooner? They all passed away into darkness without knowing whither they were going. So Shekela getting on Livingston's case a little bit about where you been? You've got this information, we needed it. And all of my forefathers have gone into eternity not having the advantage of this gospel. That did stab Livingston deeply, and it was part of what motivated him for his entire remarkable career. Livingston continues, Shekele felt the difficulties of his situation and often said, oh, I wish you had come to this country before I was entangled in the meshes of our customs. Shekele was a chief. He was expected to have multiple wives, and he did. And now he recognizes as he begins to digest the Christian message, that that's really not the way in which God has intended for us to live together. In fact, Livingston continues, he could not get rid of his superfluous wives without appearing to be ungrateful to their parents who had done so much for him in adversity. So Shekele is now in this very difficult situation of working through how exactly to develop his Christian ethic given his former experience. In former times, Shekele said, when a chief was fond of hunting, all his people got dogs and became fond of hunting too. If he was fond of dancing or music, he showed a liking to those amusements too. If the chief loved beer, they all joined in strong drink. But in this case, Shekele says, it's different. I love the word of God, and not one of my brethren will join me. Shekele felt the frustration this reminds me deeply of a character we're going to be studying pretty soon, whose name is Spokane, Chief Spokane Gary, who similarly was converted soundly to the Christian faith, in this case a Presbyterian, I'm happy to report. He preached faithfully to his native uh, tribesmen and so on, the Spokane tribes, middle Spokane and so on, with very little influence. It, it was, he was undaunted, courageous in maintaining that, but at the same time discouraged because, of course, he had such little response, and we'll look at that in some detail uh, before too long. But that was kind of the experience here. Shekele himself became a very powerful uh, preacher of the gospel in the African setting, uh, even in his own day. One historian, uh, J.H. Uh, Worcester, writes, later we learned that Shekele himself had become a missionary to his own people and had considerable influence over them, though more in material than in religious matters. He was always a warm friend of missions, had a remarkable knowledge of the Bible, and could preach well. His regard for the memory of Livingston was great, and he read with earnestness everything he could find about him. Notwithstanding that, Shekele's efforts were not as successful as had been hoped. The results show that Livingston had laid a good foundation. Robert Moffat, under whose care Livingston was there, wrote in 1874, some years later, quote, that mission is the most prosperous, extensive, and influential of all our missions in the Bokwanian country. Shekele himself died in 1881, and throughout those years he was a faithful servant of Christ among his own people. Shortly after Livingston arrived in South Africa, he married Mary Moffat, who was the daughter of Robert Moffat, who had, of course, been on the mission field herself for some time and was accustomed to the cultural circumstances. He asked and received permission from the London Missionary Society to move north. Livingston always wanted to go north. South Africa, he felt, had a Christian representation. There was a battle going on for sure. But where Livingston wanted to go was up into that dark reach which was really just unknown. And he wanted to go and lay, get the lake.